This video shows how a series of jobs and tasks are set up to run in sequence by creating the proper predecessor and successor relationships and defining any additional runtime criteria. This is called a workflow. For training purposes, we'll use a scenario that involves automating the process of onboarding a new employee. We'll show you how to do this with an atomic workflow. It involves four tasks that execute in a specific sequence. The first task, called Jobs ONB Presents, creates the new employee in the employee database. The second task, jobs.onbtrain, updates the training database to enroll the employee in training. Jobs.onbequip initiates the provisioning of equipment, but only if the preceding job completes successfully. If the predecessor fails, Atomic Automation runs a remedial task called jobs.onbremd, which checks the current status of the training database. The onboarding tasks are AA jobs, which are added to the overall onboarding sequence, called a workflow. The jobs will become tasks, which will chain together with connectors. By merely linking a task to its predecessors by way of a connector, you create a relationship between them. This gives rise to additional sets of properties like dependencies. A task with multiple successors can see these successors execute either simultaneously or one after the other, depending on the configuration. As such, it is the linking of the training task to the remedial task that makes it possible to define a dependency to ensure that remedial only occurs if the training task fails. We begin in the Jobs folder. We search for the workflow object and then select it. The solution comes with three predefined workflow templates. We're going to create a standard workflow. The other two, for each and if workflows, make it possible to design sophisticated sequences that can execute based on either conditional requirements or loops. These are out of scope. We start with a blank canvas. Workflows are designed using two sets of functions. The top floating toolbar contains three icons. The first icon is the default move function. It allows you to move elements on the canvas and move the canvas itself. The second is the select function. This will allow you to drag across the canvas and select anything inside of the drag area. Finally, the last function is connect. This allows you to create the predecessor successor relationships between the jobs. The bottom floating bar contains four functions. From top to bottom, they are zoom in, zoom out, percentage-based zoom, and fit for display. Notice the default start and end dummy jobs. They set the absolute starting and ending point for your workflow. Save for rare circumstances where tasks are not connected, any defined sequence generally fits inside of and is connected to these two objects. Creating workflows is easy. We have two browser windows side by side. On the left, the workflow object. On the right, the explorer window. We'll simply drag and drop from right to left. The next two jobs can be selected together with the control key on your keyboard. Finally, in the case of long lists of objects, we can search and add. Our workflow has four objects and could run in its current state. Without connectors, the four objects would simply execute immediately and concurrently. In order for us to create the proper sequence, we need to place our jobs in the right order on the canvas. Without connectors, this will change absolutely nothing operationally, but it will make drawing the connectors that much easier.
to connect two objects. With the connection function selected, we simply drag a line from the extremity of one to that of the other. We also have the option of selecting multiple objects and make bulk updates. Let's select two tasks and connect them to their predecessor and successor. In our requirements, if the training process ends with a no case status, then we provision. Otherwise, we trigger remedial. For this to work, we need to set dependencies in the properties of the two successors. By drawing connectors, we automatically create a relationship between a task and its predecessor. We right-click and access properties of the successors. Successor properties contain a fairly extensive number of features. We will focus specifically on the Time and Dependencies tab. So here the logic is straightforward. We need to describe the circumstances under which this job can execute based on the completion status of the predecessor. Failure can be defined by several different status codes. And so we won't be overly selective when it comes to looking for a specific status. Strictly speaking, any exit code that is not defined at the job level as an OK exit will qualify as an abend. So we select any abend. This means that an error in the batch, a canceled job, or a job in error with an unknown cause will trigger the successor. We can define the behavior of the task and, by extension, the entire workflow, if the predecessor, in our case our training process, does not end with an abend status. If the job ends with an OK status, we have several options. Block the task and the workflow, which would require some sort of input to unblock, or abort the task. This is not what we want. We want to use skip, so that if the predecessor succeeds, our task will simply be skipped, and the workflow will be able to continue in an entirely automated fashion. Now we define the success path. If the predecessor ends with a no case status and no other, we want the equipment process to trigger. We can execute the workflow and supervise the execution via the monitor. We'll run the workflow once and let it complete. Then we'll run it a second time and cancel the training process to see what happens.